Uh, thanks for joining me. I'm Paul Tilly. Today, we're going to talk about this issue of leadership. So, within this context of human resource management, we're always thinking about how do we achieve the goals of the organization, right? And you need people in order to do that. You need the people in order to do that. But again, if everybody's going off in different directions, nothing's going to be achieved. So, what we need to be able to do is to have someone to coordinate. If you've ever been down to the St. John's Regatta or any rowing race, I always liken leadership to that. Uh, if you think about the bunch of rowers in a boat, okay, so there's probably eight rowers in a boat or four rowers in a boat, and there's a coxswain up at the at the end who does nothing. Okay, they don't row or anything. That's my job. I like that job. But the fact is, the coxswain's role is probably the most important because what the coxswain does is he or she will give directions of, okay, we need to go right, left, whatever. Uh, to keep the time and these sorts of things. So the coxswain is very much a leader. And in organizations, you need someone there or people there to fulfill that role. It's no different than rowing a boat. And you say, well, okay, but those people don't do anything. Well, they do. They direct the effort so that it is pointed, focused, and achieves a particular goal. So it's directed at that goal. So the question then becomes is, well, how, how do you become a better leader? How, how do you fit in that role of the coxswain? And what are some of the things that you need to develop in order to be able to achieve those sorts of goals? Okay, so leadership in the employment situation is something that you spend a lot of time um, finessing. Leadership is something that, well, the techniques of leadership are learned, no doubt about it, but it is something that requires a lot of practice and it is something that, doesn't necessarily fit everybody. Not everybody is a good leader. However, everybody should know the basic traits of good leadership and what it is you need to do in order to, to move those things along. So what we're looking at here tonight are what are some of the key traits of leaders and what can you do to help develop those traits to become a leader yourself? So uh, as I say, leadership, big challenge facing organizations. You know, we we think of leadership and you can think of good leaders and in your mind now I want you to think about who was a good leader who was a good leader in an organization that you're familiar with in a country anywhere along the way what is it that you would think of whenever you think of leadership so i'll throw out one of my thoughts winston churchill winston churchill in world war ii the british the allies did not look like they were going to win the war man it was pretty desperate there for a while Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister of, of Britain at the time, really took on a, a very good leadership role. He got up in the House of Commons in England and made several very famous speeches. You know, we shall fight on the seas and oceans, we shall defend our islands, whatever the cost may be, we shall never surrender, his famous, famous line. Churchill embodied a lot of the traits of good leadership. Some would argue that Pierre Trudeau did too. Pierre Trudeau had good leadership in the sense that he he had a vision for what Canada was to be. You know, if we think of the late 60s and, and it was the 100th anniversary of Canada and Trudeau got on the scene and talked about the fact that, you know, we're a multilingual nation and, and all of the things that surrounded that, a just society. And I think a lot of us now would think, regardless of your political strike, that that was a good leader. You may not, you may agree or you may not agree, but the fact of the matter was he articulated a vision for what Canada should look like. In organizations, we think of good leaders. You know, you think about people who can talk well, communicate well, um, uh, are enthusiastic, have a certain degree of charisma. These are all kind of things that, that we recognize in leaders, the superficial things that we, we recognize in good leaders. And that the major components that we're going to look at here tonight, you'll see how those are enhanced or developed because those leaders have those qualities. But just go and, and take a look at uh, some of the big qualities that we want to talk about. Leaders have to influence people. So they have to have some degree of influence. And the influence has to be able to direct people towards a certain goal 
that the organization wants it to move towards, okay? So, it, you know, you, you can lead people in the wrong direction, you can lead people in the right direction, but good leadership brings people to some goal that the organization wants to achieve. Considering all of those features that I just talked about in the examples of leaders, we can kind of break it down into three of the big issues that we want to see in leaders, okay? We want to see them, first of all, being good communicators. And part and parcel of communications is information processing. How can they take information in and synthesize it and be able to convey it? So that communications role is a big thing that we want to recognize in, in a good leader. We also want to talk about, well, you take in that information, you need to be able to make a decision based on it. You know, what, what are some of the things that good leaders do in order to make good decisions or better decisions? I'm not suggesting they make all good decisions. I'm just suggesting that they, they tend to have a process that encourages or develops better decision making that is more likely to succeed. And finally, leaders have to have this ability to manage people. Could be a je ne sais quoi, something that we can't put a finger on what causes it, but certainly we do know some of the things that people need to do in order to manage people effectively. And we're going to look at all three of those now this evening. First and foremost, well, I, I, I've got a bunch of things. First and foremost, we look at well, what do we see as a good leader? And if you ask a thousand people, this is sort of like a, sort of like one of those game shows where you ask a thousand people what are the key words that come up well inspirational integrity clear goals sets good example clear vision clearly uh communicating in such a way that people understand what the vision is uh, expects the best out of people provides support encouragement recognition provides stimulating work focuses on the team very much and again you know if you think about hockey as i say Hockey and other sports that are team-related sports are really good at building leadership skills because this team-based or team focus, it takes the person into a collective grouping to achieve something. And that's a very important skill for leaders. So if you have kids, it's good to get them to play hockey or some sort of team sport like soccer. Uh, inspirational. Leaders are inspirational. I think we can think of all leaders that inspired people. You know, I, I think back to John Kennedy back in 1962 when he got up and he said, you know, our goal is to put a man on the moon before the end of this decade and return him safely to earth. And we do the things that are hard, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. These famous lines were really inspiring to a lot of people, not only in the United States in case of John Kennedy, but across the world. Uh, it was a real period of, of um, inspiration. Um, the idea of integrity has come up lately, too, and uh, I, I, I'm afraid to raise Donald Trump, but the, the issue of are leaders honest? Are they truthful? Can people believe in them to tell the truth? That's what we're really looking at for integrity, and that, that's something that a lot of people will say that organizations, the demand of organizations is that integrity and the demand of leaders. And obviously, people are very disappointed if, if we don't get integrity. In order to make all those things happen, one of the three things that we saw in order to bring that together is ability to communicate, okay, an ability to communicate. And if we look at this little process here, this process is what we call the communications process. And if you understand the basic process of communications, it helps you become a better communicator. The very fact is that if you understand what works and, and why it works the way it do, you can do it better. If we think about communications, it starts over here on the left-hand side, okay? On the left-hand side of this graphic, you will see the source, okay? Here is the source of the message. We'll call the message that gets sent through here. That source of the message. So it could be like the telephone receiver, okay? You speak into it. That message then moves through some sort of device or some sort of medium is encoded. Like for example, we're, we're sitting here now in front of our computer. 
Well, the source I'm speaking, it gets recorded by the microphone. It gets sent magically through the internet. That microphone is really the encoding tool. That computer that turns it into a bunch of zeros and ones and sends it through the magic of the internet is really an encoding tool. The message then flows through that channel, the internet, the air, paper, whatever we want to call it, whatever that tool is. And at the other end, it has to be successfully decoded. And the decoding could be a speaker on your on your headset or a speaker on your on your laptop. It could be uh, the paper that you're reading. It could be any number of things, but effectively, it is drawn out of the channel for you to receive the message. So that whole process, where we have a source, an encoding goes through a channel it's decoded and receiver can happen very quickly or it could happen more slowly if it's written. So one of the things we've noticed in the last few years with electronic communication is this process happens wicked quick. Years ago, it didn't happen so quickly. The speed of which this process happens is important because if it takes too long, then the message may get lost. People get bored. They, their sense of... Um, they, I'll, I'll say that they, they mentally get distracted. If it happens too fast, people, again, won't be able to follow it. So it has to happen at a right speed. In organizations, we talked about you know, organizational design in, in terms of the hierarchy or whether it's a flat organization, a matrix organization. We've got to think about when we build an organization, how fast does this communication process happen? Do we have so many layers that it slows this down to a crawl? And if it slows it down to a crawl, what are the implications for communications there? The other thing that's important here is the context of which the communication happens. I don't know about you, but I know with me, email is a wonderful tool for sending information. It is I can send it to multiple people at once. It goes through that channel, comes out in them, and they decode it. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a lot of context, meaning do people understand what I really meant? Could they misinterpret it easily? Do they know what I'm talking about? Okay, like if I said to you, if I typed to you and you're living in Cornerbrook or Stephenville or Timbuktu, I say to you, well, you go down Huntley Drive and you turn left and you come up, Unless you can visualize what I'm saying or be able to understand what I'm saying, it doesn't make any sense to you. Now, Stephen, you might know where Huntley Drive is because you're from Clarabelle, so it makes more sense to you. So in the context of talking to you on it, you might understand it. In the context of talking to Kent over in Stephenville, you know, it might not make any sense whatsoever. So this, this context is important, and... Usually when we write things down, context can be very challenging, particularly if uh, if we don't choose our words well. So again, uh, when you write things, context is very important. Because you miss the body language of, of speaking. Another very important feature is a good communication. Oops. Another very important feature is feedback. If communications is without feedback, <clears throat> this is a problem I'm having this year. And... I can't see you guys. I'm looking at this screen here as I talk, but I can't see you. Maybe you're screwing up your face. Maybe you have this look on you that says, I don't have a clue what he's talking about. I don't know. I can't see. There's no feedback. In a classroom, I can look at the student's face and get feedback. So I'm missing that. So the communication that works within this electronic system medium that we're using is not as good as the classroom setting for me. As I sent that, that feedback back loop is not necessarily there. So <clears throat> this is what all leaders have to understand. They have to understand that when they deliver a message, that message is encoded somehow or another. And depending on how the message is encoded, it's going to affect how it's decoded. It doesn't work well. They're also going to have to recognize that the context of which what they say and how they say it and where they say it to is going to have an impact on people's understanding of it. Context is very important, so we have to appreciate 
what is the context that you, the writer, are putting into something that you're writing, and you, the receiver, what is it that you're seeing? You know, what is the situation that you're hearing this? Is it working for you? And again, this feedback loop, is there an opportunity for feedback? Usually with voice communication, such as the telephone or speaking face-to-face -face with someone, you get a lot of feedback. It works very well for the feedback loop. What we're using here tonight or email, not so good. Granted, there is feedback. You can say, oh, I can send back an email or I can talk here, but it's after the fact. It's not immediate. So leaders have to understand this communication process and appreciate the fact that sometimes you don't have a good channel, meaning that you don't have good feedback, context is not really clear, the message gets jumbled somehow or another. Within the channel, for example, maybe it gets corrupted. Static on the telephone line is a classic example of that. Or something goes wrong with the internet. So these are all things that affect how well things are communicated. Uh, Facebook, for example, has done a lot of research on this. Uh, you know, they're a, a Goliath with regards to that. And you talk about how communication is important. If you put up a Facebook message, for example, that's just typing, you write something out, it will not have as great as an appeal, people won't read it, as much as if you wrote something and added a picture. So a photograph gives more context and gives more information. So better to use a photograph. Photograph's good, video is even better. If you put video in it, it will get that much more of a response. So they their algorithm will encourage videos as opposed to just plain text. And again, because it works better in the communication process. So knowing what we know about the communication process now, what are some of the takeaways that we should employ when we are trying to lead an organization or trying to be able to, to manage an organization? Well, one of the things that is important is the feedback, listening actively. And active listening means to actually take the effort to listen what the person is saying and attention is brought to bear in terms of what the person is saying, how the person is saying it, so that feedback loop is important in terms of active listening. The accepting of the other person. Again, what happens is we create a mental block. If you think that that person's a nut, you're going to put up a mental block, and that's going to affect your communications with that person being speaking or hearing. Try to put yourself in the other person's shoes. This idea of empathy, one of the things that social workers and people in the human services industry always talk about is having an appreciation for putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Know where the other person is coming from. Again, feedback is important there in order to get an understanding of where the other person is coming from. If you can relate to their situation, you'll understand why or why not they're hearing the message. What type of message they need to hear. How it should be best to be delivered. These sorts of things. Confusing the person with the problem, particularly whenever we're talking about managing people in terms of discipline or in terms of uh, trying to get something to change in a workplace. When you start pointing a finger at a person, what you're doing is attacking the individual as opposed to the problem or the issue at hand. So we need to be careful of uh, understanding what the problem is and then using the person to help you address the problem, not to throw them all under the bus. Saying what you feel in such a way that it communicates properly. And what I mean by that is being sure your words, thought, feelings, and actions are all the same message. If I'm telling you, wink, wink, you shouldn't do that, wink, wink, but in the meantime, I turn a blind eye to you doing it, well, that's sending out a mixed message. The words are saying one thing, the actions are saying something totally different. We gotta be careful to ensure that our messages are clear and consistent across all the, the message channels that we would use. Feedback, and again, timeless and specific feedback is important. So again, if your organization is really long or deep or it has lots of layers in it, it's very hard to get information through and it's very hard to get it returned. So speed is important. We need to be able to, be able to speed up the communication process. And that's one of the advantages of email, for example, you can send out mass emails to a lot of people very quickly. 
at speed, but it doesn't work so well in, in terms of the return or the feedback loop. Provide all new workers with a good orientation. This is something that often falls down in so many organizations. If workers who enter, it's sometimes called onboarding, when they enter an, when they enter a place of work, they don't know who to talk to, who's what, or anything like that. Orientation is so important. I remember one time, for example, when I started with the college, I was in Bonifista and we were having a chat, and I'm chatting with this guy, and I say to him, "So, what's your role with the college?" And he says to me, "Well, he said I'm the president." Oh, <laughs> so a good orientation would have certainly oriented me to that the uh, the fact of who was the president and what jobs were done. Clearly communicate a new worker's role within the workplace, and that way everyone has an idea what new worker does, what their work area is all about, and all of these sorts of issues with regards to newbies, making sure that everybody knows who they are, what they do, what their role is, how other, other people can help them. Ensure all workers receive suitable training for their jobs. Training is so important because accidents happen oftentimes because of lack of training. So training is very important. We need to be able to put that in place. And again, communicating rules, regulations, processes, all of these things are so important, particularly to new people. And encourage workers to have input. Input builds ownership. If people can have input in the procedures and tasks, make suggestions as opposed to criticism, make suggestions of what, what needs to be done, how it can be done better. Uh, that helps the communication process because they're part of the solution. So if we involve workers in decision-making, it certainly makes the job that much easier for them and it improves the communication process. So again, uh, more, more basic things that you should do at work, practical applications of the communication process, regular team meetings, you know, a lot of organizations have, for example, toolbox meetings in the morning. That would that would hand off not only for safety, but the whole communication process is improved because every morning people are used to getting together and talking about what we're going to do during the day. And it encourages workers to, to get involved in decision-making and uh, stay engaged. Provide regular feedback, as we've just seen. You know, workers need some feedback on how they're doing. Praise workers whenever the tasks are done well, as opposed to chastising when it's done poorly. Give workers practical advice. You know, if you've been working in this trade for years and years and years, your advice is sought after, needed, wanted, look forward to from new workers. The ropes to skip and the ropes to know. You know them, share them with the young people. And again, in terms of the sharing process, this idea of coaching. Usually what we have is, Someone is brought under someone's wing, okay? The senior worker, new worker comes in. He or she is assigned to a senior worker. And, and that senior worker needs to know their role. Their role is really coaching, and that's helping the new worker out. And that's a skill in and of itself. So the senior worker coaching skills are something that, that should be taught in organizations to help senior workers bring new people in and help them um, – fit into the organization, work within the organization, and help achieve the overall task. One of the things that I've seen in too many organizations is feedback that's not provided in private. Chastising a worker in front of everyone doesn't help build morale. It doesn't help anyone. So uh, personal feedback to, to workers should be done in private. You know, um, oftentimes there's some issue or whatever that, arises at some point in time or some problem, you resolve the problem face-to-face, -face, not with a thousand people watching you. Uh, implement a performance feedback system. This, this is what we talked about last week is really, you know, policies, what kind of systems we got. Um, um, the idea of having a toolbox meeting every morning is an example of a system, right? It's a feedback system. It allows you to say, at this time in the morning, we're going to get together. We're going to talk about what, what we're going to do during the day or some of the improvements we need to make or whatever. That's a system. So what we're talking about here when we talk about these systems is how can you put proper processes in place to ensure feedback quickly? Encourage workers to talk to supervisors or managers early. Keep that communication flowing because things, if they fester, can lead to problems, particularly 
in terms of communication. And ensure that these management structures that you put in place uh, are clear to workers. Who is your boss? Who is the person you go to speak to with a problem? How is the information flowed? These sorts of things really need to be clear, particularly the new employees. Some of the problems to avoid. Everybody knows about this informal communications grapevine type system that exists in organizations. I talk to my buddy and talk about the boss. Oh, that boss is awful. One of the things that happens in organizations is this informal communication system becomes the communication system. What managers need to make sure they do is they, they need to reinforce the formal chain of command, formal communication processes, formal, um, like for example, the toolbox talks again, a formal process for which information can be relayed or concerns addressed. And if you don't do that, then you're going to end up with an informal communication system where the workers end up talking to one another about gripes, not resolving them. It's just building up uh, rumors and building up issues uh, without resolving anything. Um, we also got this issue of something called filtering in organization. We've got to be very careful to avoid filtering. And, and in your own mind, it's a natural tendency to do this, okay? to do filtering. That is, I don't, I will give you good information, but I don't want to give you bad information. Or uh, I'll give you good news, but I won't give you bad news. Okay. Filtering is a natural tendency to water down negative messages at some point in the transmission. And essentially, you're giving someone half a story, giving them part of the information, not giving them full details. These all occur in organizations for a number of reasons. Uh, you don't want to tell the story because it's just too bad. You want to keep some power for yourself, so you're really reluctant to give people too much information. This is all forms of filtering, and filtering causes problems. And, you know, we need to be able to think about how can we create an open environment and prevent filtering in organizations. We've got to be able to have a climate of trust and a climate of openness and the opportunities for communication to occur. Now, we talked about this idea up above here about informal communication and chain of command. Certain general information can be more easily spread through an informal context. Oh, we're going to have a Christmas party on. You know, everybody is invited to it. It's not really particularly focused at one individual. You don't need such formal channels for that type of information. So, you know, it you got to use discretion in terms of it. But generally, what we want to be able to do is to communicate directly to the people who are affected by the message in such a way that it allows for timely, effective communication. Uh, big problems that occur with expectations too is not communication as well as very poor or not well laid out expectations. If you're the boss and you're uh, heading up a welding department and you say to someone, I want you to weld that up for me, they go and weld it and you come back and you size it up and say, well, that's not a very good welding. I need something more durable than that or it's not welded strong enough or whatever would be required. The question is, from your perspective, did you give the person who did the welding a clear expectation of what you were expecting? You know, is this going to be used for high, a high-pressure vessel, or is it going to be used for an extra strong, um, extra strong hold, or, or something that requires some heavy-duty degree? Did you relay that information to the welder? Don't blame the welder if the welder didn't do it, because your expectations were not clear. You need to be able to be crystal clear in terms of what is it you want the person to do, when you want to do it, how it needs to be done, and these sorts of things. If it's particular, now, I don't have to tell a welder how to weld, but I do have to tell the welder that this is going to be used in an application where we got a lot of stress on the joint, so we need to make sure that it's triple welded. That's the kind of thing that you need to do, is to clarify the expectations to the point that what you get meets your needs. Now, that, that is probably one of the biggest 
flaws, fall downs, problem areas that I've seen in every organization I've had anything to deal with. And that is, is a manager clearly expressing what the expectations of the outcome are? Have you told the person what you want? And if you haven't, can you blame the person if they don't provide you what you want? Okay. So it's a mutually beneficial thing in order to communicate exactly what you need. That way the person will provide that and you'll get that. If you don't clarify the expectations, you run into this problem. And this problem is not something that is really the individual's fault. And, and you can look back on yourself and say, well, maybe I was as much as fault for the problem as anything else. So something to be very aware of. Um, in order for the information to be useful, it needs to be timely. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the college uh, has run into this situation with some 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 information with regards to you guys. You know, it's, it's no good, for example, to send you information on when the class is happening the day after the class, class happened. Sometimes that happens, you know, by accident. And, and you know, it's, it's unfortunate when it happens. But if you don't know the class is happening, how are you supposed to come to the class? So information absolutely needs to be timely. Absolutely. We need to think of the context of where the information needs to be delivered when it needs to be delivered, how it needs to be delivered, and ensure that it is on time in order to have any desired effect. Any questions on that? Well, the communications thing, the communicate, I'll just hop back in the slides here. The communications thing is something that is very important to leadership, okay? It's absolutely critical in terms of leadership. But it's not the only thing. Whenever we think about leadership too, we think about how do people make decisions or, or do what they do as a leader? How do they do that sort of thing? And as a general rule, we can break leaders into one side or the other in this graphic. A task-focused leader is someone who is very focused on getting the job done no matter what. I see a wall that needs to be built. I want you to work at the wall. That's task-focused. Now, the other side of the fence is a people-focused person or a relationship-focused person. A relationship-focused person is based on looking at the individual they're dealing with, communicating with them, you know, how was your day? I, I know you personally. Let's talk about this issue of why this wall is important and how we should best build it. And do you think, you know, that you need some help at it and what color would you like it? And these sorts of things. That person, that type of leader is more relationship focused. Okay. Generally, what you will find is that individuals, it pers the personality type, will tend to fall one way or the other. And depending on the situation, it could change too. But effectively, people who are task focused leaders tend to be certain type of individual. People who are people relationship leaders tend to be another type of individuals. We, we see this in organizations all the time. And what we need to find to make a good organization is a healthy mix of the two. Sometimes tasks are very important. You know, if we think about the uh, coronavirus and the COVID-19 situation in government, okay, in government. Let's go back to the middle of March. There wasn't a lot of time there for a massive consult on the what we should do, how we should do it, when we should do it, where we should do it. Someone had to make some quick decisions. So those quick decisions were made. The task-focused leadership style really came into play there. We got to get everybody out of the workplace, safe, isolate it, so that we can stop this thing in its tracks. That was a very task-focused effort. 
did people get upset? Did they get hurt by the fact that school was shut down, their their ability to go to work, their ability to go to the store were all affected? Yes, people got upset. Of course they did. But the task was it was thought that the task was the major important item there to get done. Okay. So task focused leadership worked in that role because it was so stressful and so time sensitive and so important to achieve a certain goal in a very quick time that task focus was it. Now, if we look now though, if we look now at the environment that has calmed down with COVID, the leadership styles is changing quite a bit. It's not so longer, not so much directed anymore. Now it is more focused on how can we build a team of individuals in order to be able to achieve certain goals. So if you're a health, your health authority, the college, the university, or whatever, a lot of that now is being based on some consultations, okay? Consultation with health officials, consultation with education officials, and so on. A lot of, a lot of decision making and time, it, it takes time to get these decisions out. Um, that was very much a, a relationship focus. So we, we talk to people, we, we build good relationships in order to achieve certain goals. That's the type of that's the type of leadership that is being focused on now. In organizations, what we if we had a healthy mix of those types of leaders, depending on the job that came up, is it Something needs to be done quickly? Is it something that is of critical importance? Is it something that is pretty straightforward, you know, in terms of putting that bolt in that hole? Uh, Task-focused leadership works well for that. If something that involves a lot of people and involves uh, some thought and involves some finessing in terms of the situation, maybe different in different situations, a relationship leader is probably good for that. So where do you fit? Well, in the course, I got a couple of little tests in there, or whatever you want to call them, self-assessment exercises, we'll call them. And in those self-assessment exercises, you will do exactly this for yourself. I just want you to try those out. Where do you fall on that spectrum? We all fall somewhere along that spectrum, okay? Some of us may be more task-focused. Some of us may be more relationship-focused. Generally, what we find is that women in organizations tend to be more on the relationship side. Men tend to be more on the task focused side. <clears throat> if we think of this task focused side, what, you know, what, what is this leadership style that works there? Well, it's really very much an authoritarian. You do this or else. The military is set up to be very focused on task. Why is that? Well, the military usually applies or is applied in situations of great uncertainty or great time. Timeliness is very important. You know, you, you got to make a decision to do something very quickly. Or you need to be able to direct a thousand people to do something very quickly and very efficiently. Or a standard operating procedure. This is how we always do this. This is the way that we operate this. That's that lends itself to uh, what we call authoritarian leadership. And authoritarian leadership is is very directive. You don't need a lot of smart people to have authoritarian leadership. You just got one leader who says do that or else. Okay. It works for certain organizations. It won't work for most organizations because people don't like what to do as a general rule, okay? Now, again, in emergencies and these sorts of things where time is of the essence, everybody understands that that authoritarian leadership style, that task-focused leadership style is very important. But as a general operating procedure, someone who's a dictator coming in and telling people what to do is not going to work so well. Now, so let's let's think about some in-between stance. The in-between stance is really called a participative leadership style. And this is where it is not necessarily all task focused, but not necessarily all people focused too. And in fact, you'll find most leaders do fall in this middle category. And and this is uh what's called the democratic style, and there's 
uh, uh, the leader goes out, seeks input from people, uh, seeks guidance from, you know, uh, trusted colleagues and the like, and makes a decision based on all of that input. It takes time to make those decisions, though. They don't happen overnight. So you have to recognize that as you get more participative, you get more people involved, it takes more time, more effort, more energy, and and that that is a big downside if you're in a hurry. But it is a big upside if you want to get people engaged in the process because everybody has a role to play and you're building in ownership. The very, very far extreme that is really people focused is called a delegative leadership style. And what you do is you delegate all your decisions to everyone else. It's laissez faire is a fancy word for hands off. And that's, you could argue that that's not leadership at all. You're not really doing anything. What you do is you say, okay, well, you do what you want. You know, little or no guidance. Now, is there a place that that could work? Yeah, there is. If you've got a bunch of highly skilled professionals, like you're a professional at your trade, I don't have to tell you how to do your job. Right? You know how to do your job better than anyone. So if we know generally what needs to be done, you know, if we're building some sort of house, for example, in your carpenter, you know the, the foundation needs to be put in, then the floors, then the walls, then the, and, and so on. You know that process. You don't have to be directed to do that. However, you do have to have a general direction and say, well, here's where the house needs to go. This is how big the house is. Here's the general plan of what it looks like. But the finite detail is left to you to decide to do. So delicate of leadership works well if you got professionals, okay? People who know their job really well. It doesn't work very well if you got people who have no idea what they're doing that need a lot of direction or handholding. So putting all that together, then, putting all that together, we think about your leadership style and we think about how information is processed. And we can think about individual personality types that influence those communication styles. And if uh, you do this again, this um, inside the course, I have one of these, uh, another one of these samples of going out and doing a personality assessment. You can, you'll fall somewhere in one of those uh, director, expressor, thinker, harmonizer. And that, this across the way here, or, lines up nice with the task focus versus the relationship focus, okay? Director is very task focused, harmonizer is more people focused. What I'd like you to do is just do this example that is in the course, just to get a sense where you are. Now, is one better than the other? No, it's not. Are you one or the other? No, you're not. You will tend to have a propensity to be more like one, less like the others. But there's no such thing as someone fitting into that box and saying, you're a harmonizer, that's all you'll ever have. No, you have more of the elements. So every organization, as I say, want to try to find some balance of those. And when you find the balance of those, the employees that you have working for you really need to, to sync up with that. You would think that, you know, um, a thinker would want to work with other thinkers, for example. So if we think of a director, you know, a director is very goal-oriented, oriented, tells it like it is, makes decisions quickly, always on the go, speaks crisply, may be insensitive or intimidating. That's well, very much ta task-focused, isn't it? You can say, well, but, you know, sometimes that's the thing you need. You need a director there in order to make tough decisions quickly. You got an expressor, which is moving more, uh, an expressor, which is moving more into a participative leadership style. Uh, they're people oriented, they're animate, they're easily excited, they make expressive gestures, they can be entertaining, thinks out loud, speaks rapidly, maybe imprecise. So expressor, you know, mm, some people can say, well, they're just too flitch. If we look at the the other side of that, you think about a thinker. A thinker is, again, task-oriented, makes lists, does things by the book, speaks deliberately, believes that they're right. 
and you know there's there's a way that things need to be done and we're going to do it this way uh they may procrastinate they got to keep thinking about it so you know you could say that it's a paralysis by analysis more like it and then on the far right we got the harmonizer who's relationship oriented sensitive to others dedicated loyal speaks softly and avoids conflict as i say we can find elements in each of those in each of us but if you do this little quiz there or the little self-evaluation you will find that you're going to fall somewhere in those categories and you'll know where you sit on the end and again depending on the organization you work for depending on the role that you're in each of those roles could be more or less beneficial to you <clears throat> i got the exercise activity in there um is as i say um get you to take a look at that very same thing so that's within the course, and uh, I'll ask you to do that. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing that we talked about in, in terms of, I'll just hop back through my slides here to look at this three stages, active people management. Okay. Uh, The, as I say, um, we think about managing people. One of the things about managing people is delegating. So an understanding of the other person's communication style will help you be a, become a better manager. That includes understanding other managers, understanding your employees, understanding the organization as a whole, the kind of the general sense in the organization. You can develop an appreciation of the individual's communication style by asking questions, observing the reactions, and listening. So if you're going to hire someone, let's assume that you're, you're in the process of getting ready to hire someone. Now when you're in an interview, one of the things you're going to do is figure out, is this person the same, the right kind of communication style, the right kind of management style that you think that this type of job requires, okay? So if you ask questions of someone, you'll, you're, you have a good sense. If you ask some directed questions, you'll get a good sense or a better sense of what type of style they are. By asking two or three simple questions, you can find out a lot about someone. And these ask about you questions help you gauge someone's communication style. So let's say, for example, how do you spend your free time? Um, what do you like to read? What do you study in school? If you think about those things, let's say this free time one. Well, if someone says to you, well, I like um, individual sports and I like uh, spending time alone, this sort of thing. Is that person good for a team-based job? Probably not. However, that person says, well, I played hockey, soccer, you know, I, I'm in this group that does this and that and that. More team focus. That person might work better in a team. Again, there's nothing wrong with either one of those. It's just thinking about does the person's personality match the organization or match the job that the person's looking for? What do you like to read? Depending on the types of uh, books that a person's reading or what they're reading is going to tell you a lot about the person. And what do you study in school? Someone who's studying engineering, for example, very black and white. Okay, and engineering or, or a certain trade going to be very black and white. The pipe fits or the pipe don't. The math is right or the math is wrong. Whereas someone who's in the humanities is more gray. Okay, what is it, you know, the philosophy of? Again, the gray person is going to be more human focused in terms of relationship building. Whereas a person who's in a hard trade or a, like an engineer would tend to be less human focused and more task focused. Again, these types of things really tell a lot about an individual and what they uh, they what where they fit on that spectrum uh and again uh i just wanted to talk about this active listing you know this finding out when you're talking to people in an interview and finding out about you know them uh if you actively listen you can figure out what they 
are in terms of where they fit. You know, are they directors, expressors, harmonizers, or thinkers? And, you know, as I say, we, we talked about we talked about that back here. Okay, director, expressor, thinker, harmonizer. By asking questions that relate to those points, you can pretty well determine where someone fits. And again, people who are of common types will tend to work well together. In an organization, it's useful to have a mix of those types. But if, if you're thinking about a specific task or a specific job or who people have to work with, and common traits are important. Uh, and again, we, we talk about this idea of people working together. We're talking about teams and you know, the teams can be effective. Um, Sometimes, for example, certain jobs require many heads to come together. So effective teams in workplace happens when people consider themselves as similar. So if you're doing this job interview and you're trying to set up a team to do something, you got to think about do the personality types. If you can analyze the personality type in the interview, do these personality types match? So if you've got a wide range of people, you know, and again, there's, you need to have different viewpoints. But in the meantime, do the viewpoints be so far apart? If you're so far apart, you're not going to get this collaboration. They need to be within a realm, a reasonable realm of one another. Good leaders make for good teams. You know, again, the leadership is important in order to build a team. Clarity of communications. We talked about the importance of communications in order to build a good team. And what everyone's responsible for role. The, we're responsible for what is their roles. That's important. So teams really do a good job to, when they work well, of helping to resolve, resolve some conflicts. And, uh, and uh, you know, it does a good job at these sorts of things in organizations because everybody is involved in the decision making in a team. So normally teams are set up for a certain task. So say, for example, you got a project coming in, a project need to be done. You need to put people together in a team to get that project done. And that becomes their task then or their specific goal. And they'll work towards that goal and it helps in terms of overall effectiveness. Uh, one of the things that I'd, I'd like you to do in here, and I got a couple or three of these within this, uh, within this uh, particular module is these little self-assessments in terms of leadership style, team-based management, communication style. You'll see a few of those within there. And, I find them neat to do, and I hope you do too. So what I'm looking for you in discussion is really give me a sense of what you thought about it once you've done it. How can we encourage teamwork? As I say, all of these things are, are, are there, you know. Uh, get, get the people together, um, develop Good communications, other responsibilities, that all helps build team. And I say I got this discussion activity in there that relate to determining where you sit of your self-assessment for listening and team building. The second last thing that we're going to talk about tonight is coaching. And this is important in organizations, particularly as you get to our age, which is where you have younger people coming in. It's important for organizations to always build themselves, and the way they do that is by sharing information between the older people and the newer people. And as I said, one of the great ways that we can do this is through coaching. So effectively what you have is you have trained senior employees whose job it is to pass along, develop the skills of work with newer employees. And this is... Um, this is something that's very popular in business right now, and that is we can actually help retain people and build people if we went into um, some coaching or to develop a, a coaching practice. 
So from a coach's point of view, if you're in your organization, if you want to build some leadership skills amongst your group, this coaching opportunity gives a great, great opportunity to do that. But you just can't throw someone at someone and say, here, you go with him now and you figure it out. In order to, in order to develop good coaches, what you need to do is develop a plan. Now, does it have to be a comprehensive plan? No. But it has to clearly say, this is what we expect. This is what we expect. So we develop a clear vision, what you want the employee to achieve and how best to achieve it. That applies to both, that applies to both coach and the coachee, okay? Here's what we want the coach to do. Here's what we hope the coach E will get from that experience. The coach is going to help practice the desired skills uh, and help the, the new employee practice the desired skills. Here are the things that the coach wants to demonstrate. Coach E will go and do them. Coach E is going to evaluate it and help that person to see. Uh, the coach often is going to have to help develop the best way to communicate content, what works well. So again, and all this means is think about it before you do it. What is it that you need to do in order to help this process work? The coach needs to have good listening skills. What is it that we need to hear from the student in order to be able to learn? Uh, encourage self-evaluation, not only of the coach, but of the, the coachee. What is it that we, we can do better? What is it the things that we do really well? Celebrate successes and reward success. And uh, the big one that a lot of coaches have some challenge with is using technology. Um, but, you know, we don't have to think computers and all that stuff. We can think very simple technology. Uh, smartphones, take a picture of something and show someone what it looks like when it's done. You don't have to go right into a heavy duty. But you know, the technology is at our hands now. You know, in our hands, in a smartphone, we got a video recorder, an audio recorder, um, a typewriter, a picture taker. So all of that technology is really built into a cell phone. We should use these types of tools to help do stuff a lot better. Uh, the, the, the next great discussion really asks you to think about those sorts of things. Uh, think about something that you're good at and you could easily teach someone. It could be fly tying, welding, whatever. And uh, what I want you to do is you're the coach. So you do, uh, you do some sort of a coaching plan effectively. So give me some instructions. You're going to show me, okay? I'm the coach. Uh, what's the basic instructions? Uh, what am I going to learn? Give me the big picture. So how does this fit into everything? Uh, how it will help me do a better job? Any specific instructions? Demonstrate the task by outlining the steps involved. Have a practice task and provide some feedback. So let's say, for example, I'll just make you a carpenter for a minute. And you're going to show me how to cut off, <coughs> how to use a chop saw to cut a 45 degree angle okay there's a classic example so you're gonna you're gonna show me how to do that so the basic instructions are um get the saw don't plug it in until it is ready to operate set the set the saw on a 45 degree angle and lock it in place uh then you uh plug the saw in get the piece of board put it in the saw um, the channel, whatever, put it up against the backboard and turn on the saw, drop the saw blade down to cut the board off, being careful that the board doesn't kick back. Okay? The big picture? Well, the big picture is, look, if you don't make a 45-degree angle, it won't go on square and your thing will end up squished and it won't look very good. So you really need to, to make sure that it's a proper 45-degree angle in order to get a perfect 90-degree Okay, that's the big picture. Gives me an idea. Why am I doing a 45 degree angle? What's the big importance of it? Um, uh, how will it help me do a better job? Well, if I'm building windows or if I'm building something, a house, it needs to be square. If it's not square, things won't line up and it makes it very difficult. So you really need to ensure that everything is cut on a proper angle. Special instructions. Make sure I wear safety glasses because chips will fly off when you're using the saw and they could poke your eye right out. Okay, simple as that. Demonstrate the task by outlining the steps. I just did that by saying, okay, here's the basic steps. 
have them practice the task. So what are you going to do to get me to practice it? You're going to get me a piece of two by four and you're going to say to me, now you set up the saw, okay? And cut the board off. And we're going to put two together at the end and we're going to measure if it's an 80 grain. Now, it's difficult to provide some feedback in this scenario, but the fact of the matter is what would you do with, with how would you provide the feedback? Uh, think about like, uh, you know, did it meet the angle? You demonstrate that you, you put it on the, like I cut off two forty fives. You put it together and say that that's not square. Here's why it's not square. I put a square against it. It's not working. So this is how I provide the feedback. So that's the kind of thing I was looking for in terms of of that. Now that's a that's an example of wood, but I'd like for you to use whatever you think is necessary tonight. And again, reflecting back on the very beginning here, reflecting back on the very beginning when we talked about this idea of leadership. We talked about communication, we talked about decision making, and we're, we're talking about this idea of people management and how to effectively manage people. We talked about coaching. But another thing is employer recognition. The, the final thing tonight is, what is the advantage to us as an organization to recognize employees? So why are we doing it, first of all? Well, not only is employee recognition beneficial to the employee that's recognized, but it's also beneficial to everyone else because it motivates, provides a sense of accomplishment, and makes employees feel valued in their work, makes them know their value, no feeling to it, makes them know their value. Uh, not only boosts individual employee engagement, but it also has been found to increase productivity and loyalty to the company, leading to higher retention. Beyond communicating appreciation and providing motivation to the recognized employee, the act of recognition also sends positive messages to other employees on what it requires to succeed here. And uh, recognition is both a tool for personal reward and an opportunity to reinforce desired culture, okay? So we talk about this word culture, that's the first time that's come up here. Culture is the overall feel of the organization. If we're a rewarding organization and, and praise is positive, that sends a very positive, happy feeling to people to say, you know, I'm going to get recognized for something I do well. Why are we doing this recognition? Well, there's a war for talent today. You know, um, there's lots of people out there looking for jobs, but there's not a lot of good people looking for jobs. So organizations and leaders are looking for the right people and they want to keep them when they got them. So you need to feel good about your organization if you're going to stay in your organizations. And if you don't feel at it, recognize you're going to be gone. So how much does it cost? Well, it does cost money. No doubt about it. Every time you buy a person a coat or you give them an award or give them a trip somewhere, it costs money. But it doesn't have to cost a lot. And you think, what is the benefit? Well, if you lose employees, that's an expensive proposition for your company. So you have to measure out. Now, how much is the cost of rewarding versus how much benefit do I get from it? So employee recognition doesn't have to be expensive, but it is certainly cost beneficial. What are some of the methods? Well, public recognition or acknowledgments. acknowledgements. In today's world of social media, it's very easy to do that, isn't it? But you know, public within the organization, you know, having someone's picture up on the wall, sometimes it's helpful or a ceremony at work and that sort of thing certainly goes a long way. And we can also think about private recognition. Private recognition is the proverbial pat on the back or peer or potentially a customer, a nice letter from a customer, for example. Um, one of the biggest things that comes out of employer recognition is a promotion. Uh, you know, if you can prove that you can do a good job, well, buddy, that's a good sign that you're probably capable of doing a better job doing something else. And sometimes monetary reward comes in where you make more money. What are the basic things that managers should be aware of with regards to this? Well, business managers really need to promote a recognition-rich environment with praise coming from every direction, not just one person. So it rings hollow if it's just one person. It really needs to be seen as the appreciation coming from the organization, not just one person. Uh, employee feedback should be frequent and timely. People need to know what they're being rewarded for. Rewarding employees who are top performers can adverse, adversely affect performers' motivation. Um, 
if everybody gets a reward, if everybody gets a reward and you're the, the top seller, you're going to think, well, what's so good about me being the top seller if, if everyone gets the same reward? So your reward needs to reflect the effort. And that sometimes is challenging because it's easy to talk about, but it's hard to do. Um, and, and recognizing the employees go a long way to, to allowing an employee to, to grow and work in an organization. 